eight years about after Ali, you decided to realize uh, again uh, a picture based on a true character. Uh, did you change your way to approach to this kind of movies, this kind of characters in these years? It's a, it's a progression of these. I mean, in, in Heat, the most interesting parts of Heat for me were the um, were when I felt I was inside a character's decision. Like when De Niro decides he goes through the white tunnel and he decides, you know, he's going to go get Wengro because he's suddenly he's spontaneous and it's working. So he gives up rigid ideology, you know, and just becomes spontaneous and goes for Wengro because it makes it fatal, tragic mistake. But like with that moment of decision, um, that in, in parts of Ali, when, when I felt he was, uh, that we were inside, we, we knew what he was feeling without words. The whole idea is without words. We knew what he was feeling without words. Um, and then in this one, I wanted to, to uh, uh, be even more in depth in, in terms of his history, where the, you meet him in the present, his present, but it, it, it's an incident in the beginning that is kind of a fractal. And in that fraction of his trying to break out his friends, and he loses Walter Dietrich, a man who's a, like a father to him, right? Well, in his reactions to those things, in that fra their small experience, you come, hopefully, you come to know the whole man. You know, he has emotional connections to people. And when something tragic happens, he feels that 100%, but he's very tough, and he could take that and put it aside. And I don't know that people think it consciously, but if the movie works, you never know for me if the movie works. If the movie works, you might think, someone asked you, this is the kind of guy who, is, who has had a very tough history. Emotionally alive, but a very tough history, because he's a tough-minded, he's tough-minded. So you know, so you're learning about him in every little detail. The way he stands and he he breaks into a prison to break his people out. It's still the biggest armed prison break in U.S. history. When the girl comes up to him in the Dust Bowl house and the fireman says, "Take me with you, Mister Stranger," you know, can't do that, honey. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's it's you feel you 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 are learning about Dillinger yeah. without text, and that's what I'm interested in. Di preciso come ti guadagni da vivere? Sono John Dillinger, rapino banche. E dove mettono i soldi tutte queste persone? Perché me lo hai detto? Potevi inventarti un'altra storia. Perché non voglio mentirti. È azzardato dirlo a una ragazza che vedi per la prima volta. Io ti conosco. Ma io non conosco te. So in that sense, it's an advance on, um, for me, it's an advance on Ali because it's much more psychological, it's, it's much more expressionistic of really who the guy is because I think it's fascinating to, um, you know, to, to feel that I know what John Dillinger's thinking. I know what kind of person John Dillinger, he's very different than you and I, he's very different. We have nothing in common. But I, but he's also a human being, and I know how he's thinking. I know how he's feeling, and he, he. Uh, I mean, we don't live our lives for the moment, where all you're worried about is this week. We think beyond this week or this month. He didn't. He's right now. All he thinks about is right now, and suddenly he's confronted with, uh, you know, Clark Gable playing himself in the theater, and asks himself questions about his existence, his life. Do, when do I die? Should I struggle to survive if they, if they surround me? Should I surrender? We already know. They're out there. Should I surrender? Should I spend the rest of my life in prison? That's what Alvin Carpus did. He spent 33 years in Alcatraz. Okay, and then he got out and went to Marbella. But, but, uh, or New York, but, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and he's experiencing that movie, which is really the movie he was seeing, by the way. That's historically the movie he was seeing, Manhattan, Manhattan. And Clark Gable is talking, Clark Gable's partly based on Dillinger, and he's talking to Dillinger. It's like the biggest questions in his life. How should my life end? You know, or a dialogue going on in a movie theater with himself and Clark Gable, and meanwhile the FBI is outside ready to assassinate him. So I mean, it, it's you know, what was he thinking when he walked on that sidewalk, having heard Gable say those things? And you know, and 
you know, Myrna Loy looks like Billy Frechette, the same narrow chin. I mean, it's like, I couldn't imagine what, what the real John Dillinger that night thought watching that movie, you know. Um, somebody said that he laughed. There, there's a reference in the movie elsewhere to, uh, you know, in the, in the, when he's in Crown Point, Indiana, in the jail earlier on in the movie, and that prosecutor puts his arm up on his shoulder. The prosecutor got, got um, uh, condemned by everybody for being that friendly with Dillinger, ruined his career. And elsewhere in Manhattan melodrama, there's a reference to that, because Dillinger was the most famous man in America, except the president, so. Io dichiaro che gli Stati Uniti d'America inizieranno la prima guerra al crimine. E sono lieto di presentarvi uno dei nostri migliori G-men, l'agente Melvin Pervis, che dirigerà l'ufficio esterno qui a Chicago, il centro dell'ondata criminale che sta dilagando in America. Il suo incarico sarà quello di arrestare il nemico pubblico numero uno, John Dillinger. Direttore, agente Pervis. Dica qualche parola. In some way, Public Times talks about a uh, system of rules, right. I mean uh, FBI and organized crime, that wants to preserve the, the social order and to destroy, uh, in some way, the, the anarchy and the utopia of the single John Dillinger. Do you think, in some way, uh, Public Enemy is, is a pessimistic, pessimistic movie? It's, it, the future is, the future for bandits like John Dillinger was, is definitely pessimistic. You know, I mean, he was, um, it's pessimistic because he was out of his time. His time was the 19th century. That's when there was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and all the independent ro bank robbers all the way into the teens. And uh, some famous guys you've never heard of, like Harvey Baylor and uh, Harvey Bailey and Herbert K. Lamb. You ever hear the expression, on the lamb, on the run? It's from Herbert K. Lamb. And he was, he went uh, in World First World War, he went back to Germany and was in the Prussian military and took the tactics that he learned in the military, brought him back to the United States and invented modern bank robbery. One of the men with him was Walter Dietrich. Walter Dietrich is the, is the person that's yes. dragged behind the car when Dillinger, Walter Dietrich became a mentor to John Dillinger. So that's how this got handed down. I think that I think that Dillinger is um, is pessimistic for him because he's out of his time and he's an anachronism. You know, he's he's, he's a dinosaur. He's outmoded. The the uh, you know I got that feeling from the scene. You know, the scene on the beach at night when he and Billy are on the beach at night. I mean, to me, it felt I went I chose that location because it felt somewhat surreal. It felt like it felt like. Um, you know, like almost a Paleolithic beach or something, you know, I mean, it's, it's, yes. uh, he's out of his time. And, and uh, so it could be, it could be the individual manifesting himself and trying to manifest himself in, uh, uh, independent of the social forces, but the social forces are coming to Crush him. So who killed John Dillinger? It's two sets of social forces. It's the organized crime, which took away his ability to resupply, and it's the birth of the FBI, who finally, after a year and a half of fumbling, got not bad when they brought in the guys from Texas. Um, but it, it's the same theme as, as uh, Wild Bunch, the Peckinpah movie, which is brilliant. Poignant movie. It's, a, it's, a, it's funny how some films just stick forever. They may win awards, they may not win awards, it doesn't matter. You know, they, they, they're there for forever. Wild Bunch will be there forever. Dr. Strange Love will be there forever. You know, 3D, not 3D. <laughs> I think also yeah. some of your movies will be there forever. Yeah, well, hopefully, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. After uh, three movies and uh, about 10 years, you're back to work with Dante Spinotti. Right. And um, this is the first movie you shot in digital together. Right. Uh, did you change the way to work with him? No, Dan, no, because we, the, the, the uh, digital is, um, is the medium, but then you have to invent the advantage of digital is that there's many ways to use it. So once you say digital, okay, the digital medium. Now, how do we use the digital medium? Because I could make something look like collateral. I could make it look like 
Miami Vice, daytime, which is very saturated color, very saturated chroma. You know, yellows are really yellow. You know, black is really saturated. Um, or it can make it look, uh, you know, it's in any other way. Um, it's very golden and warm. Um, so in that, there's always, it's always a new experiment every time you begin on the film. It's determined by the film. But we're, we're very close friends. Our families are very close. And uh, whether we work together or not work together, it doesn't matter. We're very, very close. And his wife, Marcella, his son, Ricardo, you know, so it's, uh, so we, we uh, you know, we're, so it was great to work together again. Mrs. Mann, thank, thank you. you very much. Ferma quella macchina! Bureau of Investigation! Ferma la macchina! Fuori,